and welcome to Asteroid Day 2020 and our digital panel, Ingredients of Life, bringing asteroid samples to Earth. Now, currently, there are two asteroid missions flying, Japan's Hayabusa 2 and America's OSIRIS-REx. Now, Hayabusa 2 visited the asteroid Ryugu and OSIRIS-REx is currently at the asteroid Bennu. Both spacecraft have already returned incredible images and new information, but the best is yet to come as they return samples from their respective asteroids back to Earth to be analysed by scientists. Now, I'm Sarah Crudis. I'm a space journalist, author and TV host, and I'm delighted to welcome our three panellists today. So we have Dr. Makutu Yoshikawa, who is the Hayabusa 2 mission manager from the Japanese Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA. We have Dr. Patrick Michel, who is Director of Research at CRNS, Cote d'Azur Observatory, and the NeoMap Project Coordinator. And last but not least, Professor Dante Loretta, who is a Professor of Planetary Science in the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory at the University of Arizona, and he is the Principal Investigator for NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission. And Makoto, I wanted to start uh, with you, because obviously you've now captured the sample from the asteroid, and you're you're in the second process of returning this to Earth later this year. Can you set the scene by describing the highlights so far of the mission? Yes. Uh, I am Makoto Yoshikawa, uh, the mission manager of the Hayabusa 2. Uh, Hayabusa 2 is the second asteroid sample return mission following Hayabusa. Uh, the target of Hayabusa was uh, Itokawa, uh, which was S-type NEO. So uh, we chose C-type asteroids for the uh, target of Hayabusa 2. And uh, in Hayabusa mission, we had uh, lots of uh, technical trouble. So uh, we made modified spacecraft for Hayabusa 2. So up to now, uh, all the operations of Hayabusa 2 were successful. Hayabusa 2 was launched uh, in December 2000. 14, and uh, uh, it arrived at uh, asteroid Ryugu in uh, June 2018. And then uh, we made a lot of observations, and uh, in September of 2018, uh, we released two small rovers, Minerva 21, and uh, they were successful, uh, and, and they took a lot of uh, picture on the surface of Ryugu by hopping. And then uh, we released small lander mascot, uh, which was made by the Viera and Kness. It was also successful. We got a lot of scientific data. And next thing was uh, touchdown. Uh, touchdown was very difficult because we did not find flat, wide flat area on the surface of Ryugu. Ryugu was covered by a lot of uh, borders. So uh, we postponed our t first touchdown until the uh, February 2019. And finally, we found very small area. The diameter is just uh, six meters. There, uh, uh, hypes of two. Uh, went down and make a, made a touchdown. So first touchdown was successful. And the next challenge was the uh, impact experiment. Uh, we uh, we tried, tried to make a, a small crater on the surface of Ryugu. Uh, we did this experiment uh, in April 2019. And it was also successful. So, final big thing was the second touchdown. Uh, we found small area near the actual crater. So, uh, in the second touchdown, uh, the spacecraft went down to the uh, quite near to the actual crater to get the subsurface material, and the second touchdown was also successful. So. We, we, we saw, we think, uh, we were able to get the uh, surface material of Ryugu. And last, uh, November, uh, spacecraft 
started from Ryugu, and now uh, it is on the way back uh, to, to the Earth. So, uh, and, and HFC2 will come back to the Earth at, at the end of this year. So this is a HFC2 mission. And how much of a, a technical feat, particularly of engineering, because I feel everyone talks about the scientists, but also the engineers are the ones who um, create these great dreams of scientists. Um, how much of a, a technological challenge has it been to, to do this? So I think the biggest technical challenge was the uh, impactor. Uh, Hyrusa 2 uh, has small impactor. It is just a small box. And uh, inside, uh, there, there was the explosive. So impactor explode and uh, shot, shot the uh, two kilogram copper to the surface of Ryugu and uh, made an uh, artificial crater. So before the experiment, we thought the size of the crater may be just very small, just, the, just three meters in diameter. But uh, in, in fact, the, actually the uh, crater we made was very, very big. The diameter was uh, 15 meters. So uh, uh, we were very excited to see that we can make such a big crater just by a very small impact. And, and Dante, um, just to bring you in here as well, um, so the OSIRIS-REx mission, you'll be gathering your sample, you, you've yet to gather your sample, but um, it's an incredible mission, but I was just wondering if you could talk us through how it's different um, to the, um, the Hayabusa 2 mission, uh, and how, what are the similarities, and how can the, the science from the two missions uh, work together to increase our knowledge and our understanding of asteroids? Sure. Um... So NASA's OSIRIS-REx mission has targeted a near-Earth asteroid named Bennu. Uh, we selected this asteroid for several reasons, primarily based on its color and its reflectance. It's a very dark asteroid. And uh, much like Hayabusa 2, we're interested in organic-rich, carbon-rich uh, asteroids because we want to understand if these kinds of materials delivered the seeds of life to the early Earth and maybe be the reason that Earth is a habitable planet and why we're here today. Uh, Bennu also is a potentially hazardous asteroid with a non-negligible chance of impacting the Earth. And so we really wanted to understand the forces that determine its orbital evolution through the solar system, primarily a phenomenon called the Yarkovsky effect, where uh, asteroids absorb solar radiation and then re-emit that energy as heat back into space and that imparts a thrust on the asteroid and actually substantially alters its trajectory. So the two missions have a lot in common. Uh, the two asteroids may be linked to each other, uh, at least in near Earth space, they're following very similar dynamical paths. Uh, and macroscopically, they share some common traits, especially this really interesting spinning top shape that they both have, which seems to be relatively common in the asteroid population. Uh, but when you get up close and personal between the two asteroids, they start to show some intriguing differences as well. And for me, one of the most exciting things, uh, having participated in both these programs and cheered on our colleagues in Japan and around the world uh, on their successes of Hayabusa 2, is uh, the different chemistry of the asteroid surfaces. So one of the things that often accompanies carbon-rich materials in the solar system is the presence of water. And we've seen a very deep hydration band in the spectra of, of asteroid Bennu. And it looks like the mineralogy is dominated by water-bearing clay minerals. The asteroid Yugu also has a, a feature that shows the presence of water on the surface, but it's very subdued and shallower compared to what we see on asteroid Bennu. So all of a sudden we have this great puzzle, these two asteroids look very similar spectroscopically, their shapes are similar, uh, yet their chemistry is different. So we want to understand what has happened to these two different asteroids to lead to such interesting results. So um, Patrick, I'm just going to bring you in here because obviously you've worked, um, had the pleasure uh, of working on um, being involved in both of these missions. So I just wanted to talk to you um, a little bit more about the science in terms of the composition of these two asteroids and why it's so significant and what we've learned so far. Yeah, so first I want to say that for me it's a, a great honor and a great pleasure to be part of these two amazing missions. 
Uh, I'm a scientist, I'm French, and I am on a Japanese and an American mission. It's absolutely fantastic. And I want to emphasize also the complexity of these missions and the successes already accomplished. Uh, Hayabusa 2 performed all its operation very successfully, and uh, it's a very complex, space is hard, so especially uh, two touchdown to get, get two samples, uh, an impactor, two deployment of rovers, a lander, and everything was so successful. When you compare with the first Hayabusa mission, which yet returned samples, there were a lot of uh, technical problems. And then when you compare with Hayabusa 2, each kind of similar operation was very successful each time, so it was a great surprise. And on OSIRIS-REx also, when OSIRIS-REx arrived, it went into orbit around Bennu. And this is the first time we go over a, such a small asteroid into orbit, because Hayabusa 2 was hovering. So it was really great, and plus there were many flybys of the surface with cameras on OSIRIS-REx that I must say have a quality which is absolutely fabulous. So basically it feels like you, you are on site at a few hundred million kilometers away and you discover two new worlds. Because you have to remember that before Hayabusa 2 and Irish Rex, we had no detailed image of a, such the Carbonaceous type asteroid. We just had a flyby of, of a big asteroid in the main belt by the near mission in 1997, but that was very distant and just 15 minutes. Here we are there and we have a level of detail which is uh, really telling us a lot. So that's why also we had a lot of surprise. So one of them was actually that Ryugu and Bennu have the same, as Dante said, the spinning top shape. So that was expected for Bennu because we have already radar observation from the ground. And so we, have, we had a better constrained shape model. For Ryugu, we didn't expect that. Such that when we arrived at Ryugu, I thought we, we were on the wrong tar target because basically it looked like Bennu. Of course, Ryugu is bigger, so we could uh, identify it's not the case. Also, something super amazing is that uh, at the equator, so basically a spinning top has a, a sort of bulge at the equator. And uh, when we saw uh, Ryugu, on the bulge, there were a few large craters, which have really the shape of a crater. And when we arrived on Bennu, we had the same. So that's something that, how come? I mean, we have exactly the same structures uh, from distance, at least. After that, there were some details, uh, which are different. Then we measure the density, and they have the same density. So they have a density which is 1.2 gram per cubic centimeter. It's just a density above the water, meaning that they have a lot of porosity, a lot of voids inside them. So they are like uh, aggregates, if you want. And then they have the same uh, darkness. So many, 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 many similarities, but the difference, which is the level of hydration, which is, seems to be higher on Bennu than on Ryugu, at least on the surface. So that puzzled us. Uh, they seem to come from the same region of the uh, asteroid belt. Dynamically, we have some models that tell us that they come from the inner part of the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. So already a link, and we're interested to know if they have also a genetic link, let's say. So uh, we made some models in order to, to see that. Uh, what we know is that these bodies are at least of second generation because all asteroids which are smaller than a few tens of kilometers in size necessarily come from the disruption of a larger asteroid because small asteroids have a very small lifetime against collisions. So they are necessarily born much later after the solar system was born. So uh, we did some simulations to understand what happened when an asteroid is destroyed in the main belt. We have many collisions in the main belt, and then these bodies are destroyed. And then we find that when we destroy a big asteroid at the impact energies that occur in the main belt, you first produce very small fragments, which are 100 meters in size or smaller. And then when these fragments are ejected, their velocities remain small enough that they come back together and they form small aggregates. And Bennu and Ryugu, their low density is well explained by this aggregate structure. Because when you agglomerate together boulders, of course, you have voids between the boulders. And then we looked at the shape of this fragment that re-agglomerate. And we found that in some cases, we produce the kind of shape shapes like Bennu and Ryugu. So this shape could be at least, uh, uh, maybe could be uh, b made by the formation of these bodies from a larger parent body. And when we look at the level of hydration, so we assume that the plant body has a given level of hydration. And then we look at what happened for the aggregates. And we found that when we destroy a hydrated body, some of the aggregate will get some material that was heated by the impact. 
and therefore will be less hydrated than other aggregates that come from the material that was preserved from the heat of the impact and they will be more hydrated. So in other words, when you destroy a large asteroid, which is hydrated initially, then you will have some uh, children. Some of them will be hy hydrated and some of them will not be so much hydrated, which is exactly what we find for Bennu and Ryugu. So that's why we believe that maybe, it's not necessarily, but maybe Bennu and Ryugu come from the same asteroid family. And this is what we will be able hopefully to, uh, to confirm or invalidate with the samples. Because when you get the samples on Earth, and the Dante is an expert on the analysis of the samples, you can do a level of analysis. I mean, the knowledge is totally different than what you get in situ. So we will probably be able to discriminate between these two scenarios. And how significant would it be um, if it was found out when you bring the samples back to Earth that they, they are indeed related? Maybe not twin well, siblings. Yeah, in fact, something which is very important uh, for asteroid sample missions compared to meteorites, for instance. So we have meteorites on Earth, they come from asteroids. You could say, okay, we have meteorites. Well, first of all, we have a bias because the strongest material come to Earth and the most fragile part is lost in the atmosphere. And this, this is what we believe, believe is the most primitive. And then the problem with the meteorites is that we, don't, we have an idea of the kind of parent body they come from, but you don't know exactly where they come from. So with a sample, what you have is the geological context where you took the sample. So you have a full knowledge of the context, but then if you can have also a better knowledge of the history of the asteroid, then of course you, you, you go back in, the, in time uh, uh, much more, I mean, much, with a much more rich information. So what we try to do with the model is try to, try to understand where these bodies come from, which kind of family, when they were formed, so that you can really trace back the whole history of the asteroid. And then with a the sample, you can go even earlier in time because these bodies preserve the original composition of the solar nebula in which the planet formed, because they were, they were never big enough to be eaten like the planets. So you can basically go back from the early phases of the solar system to the formation of these asteroids, and then to the time when they are now around the near Earth space. So that's why it's very important. If they come from the same family, then we can identify the family in the asteroid belt because with observations, we identify groups of asteroids in the asteroid belt that share the same kind of position and composition. And we believe that they come from the disruption of parent bodies. So we have some asteroid families that match the spectra of Bennu, Ryugu. And so what we can do is if we know they come from the same body, we hopefully can identify exactly where they come from. And so we can really trace back the whole history of these bodies, which is fascinating. Obviously the, the title of this panel is Ingredients of Life. And can you just talk us through um, the current theories at the moment um, about how asteroids um, could have, or one of these asteroids could have potentially seeded life on Earth and, and how significant um, the research you're going to be able to do when we get these samples back to Earth will be? Yeah, when we look at models for the formation of the solar system and we look at the materials that were most likely to accrete and form the Earth, uh, we expect that they would be very depleted in carbon. Carbon is an element that tends to form solid materials out in the outer reaches of the solar system, in the outer main asteroid belt, or even beyond Jupiter. Uh, and so Earth is relatively depleted in carbon when you look at the bulk composition of the Sun, which represents the average composition of the solar system. And so there had to be a mechanism to deliver the carbon to the Earth, which, as we know, is the central element for life. When we look at rare classes of meteorites, uh, we call these the carbonaceous chondrite meteorites. But even in, among that group, only a few of those samples have a lot of carbon inside them and carbon in organic molecules. And we start to understand that chemistry and we see there's some very interesting compounds things like amino acids, which make up the proteins in our bodies, nucleic acids, which make up the DNA and RNA, which contain all of our genetic information. But we are uh, confused because with these meteorites have landed on Earth and they have been colonized and contaminated by bacteria almost immediately upon collection. So the, one of the main motivations to go get samples from the surface of these asteroids is so that you have a pristine sample that you know where it's been the entire time from the point it left the surface of the asteroid till it got into our laboratories and we could make that chemical analysis. 
And that's important for several reasons. One is we want to understand if the amino acids that make up these proteins are abundant in these asteroids and if they were likely to deliver those to the surface of the earth, providing the basic ingredients for the origin of life. That's important for us to understand our origins on earth, but it also is important to understand the likelihood that life took hold elsewhere in the solar system. When we look across the broader spectrum of planetary exploration, our programs are driven by the search for life on Mars or the search for life on Europa or on Titan. And if we can understand that organic molecule formation occurred and is preserved in these asteroids, then the likelihood that the ingredients for life were delivered throughout the solar system goes way, way up and the likelihood that there might be some form of life on these other planetary destinations increases. But that, um, you, you read my mind there because that was gonna be um, my next follow-up question for you. Um, for me, um, is that significant though, because at the moment when we look for life elsewhere within our solar system, from my understanding, the most significant thing is if it has been a separate genesis within our own, is there the potential then that all life or, or a large amount of life, if we find life elsewhere within our solar system is actually related and then what could that mean uh, for the hunt for life elsewhere because obviously if we had two separate genesises within our one average solar system you could look at the math and say the likelihood is there's a lot more life out there but if, if life is related say we're related to life on mars or europa for example how does that change um our understanding so when we go back to the idea for the formation of the planets, it, that these asteroids were accreting and then right at the end, these carbon rich asteroids were delivering these basic building blocks to the surfaces of the planets. So if the origin of life occurred on Earth and in a court occurred on Mars, they both started with the same ingredient pool. But the origin of life, which is still one of the greatest mysteries in science, how you go from a collection of organic molecules into a functioning metabolic living system. We haven't figured out how that happens yet. That we think occurred on the surface of the earth. Uh, it was just that these asteroids delivered all of the ingredients to get that process started. And that would mean the surface of Mars had the same set of ingredients. So it had the same starting point. And then if the origin of life occurred, it, it must have followed its own path, a Martian specific path. And you're right, it does have implications even beyond our solar system because Carbon is the third or fourth most abundant element in the universe. It's, it's everywhere that we look astronomically. When we look at places where stars are forming and planets are forming, we see carbon, we see hydrogen, we see oxygen. These are the most important uh, elements for biomolecules. So if we can tell that this organic chemistry that was essential to create the precursors of life is something that's um, happening in protoplanetary disks and then getting preserved in these asteroids, the likelihood that that's happening in other stellar systems goes way up and the likelihood that the origin of life has occurred somewhere else in the universe increases substantially. So does yeah, that mean- can, can I say something about that? Yeah, just to find that, I mean, uh, <laughs> you have to realize that when we build planets in a planetary system, you have many phases of instabilities. And in particular, on the end of a terrestrial planet formation, then we know that we have a lot of impact occurring. So it's natural to think that you know, these bodies carried all the elements that made the emergence of life. And that's what we try to test. And what happens in terms of planet formation in the solar system is the same process that happened in other planetary system. But simply depending on the initial conditions, you will build a solar system like ours, or you will build a solar system which is very different. And actually we know now that you have a great diversity of uh, planetary systems. And actually for now, we only have ours that look like ours but uh, uh, it's just depending on the initial conditions. And everything relies on accretion by collision. So necessarily at some point, you have some material that come from the outside uh, that implement basically the material. The question is whether these asteroids did that for the Earth. And Makoto, I wanted to um, bring you back in because obviously Hayabusa 2 is returning the samples from the, um, the asteroid um, at the, the end of this year. Can you just talk us through what preparations are currently underway and, and how big a sample you're actually returning to Earth? Yes. So now uh, in JAXA, uh, we have, uh, we made the attritional uh, facility. So uh, we are ready to have a capsule now. So the uh, capsule will uh, come back to the Earth and uh, uh, go down to the, uh, on the desert of Australia, 
uh, at the end of this year. So uh, after uh, uh, after uh, we find the capsule, we quickly uh, bring it back to Japan, and uh, uh, we will we will check the capsule and then open open it in our situation uh, facility. Yes. And, and how excited are you um, to to see these samples return to Earth? Yes, uh, of course we are very uh, uh, exciting, and uh, 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 we we do hope that uh, there are lots of samples in, in the capsule. However, uh, we don't know how much sample we got. Uh, until we open the capsule, so wow. yes. <laughs> so uh, when we open the capsule, we are very nervous, but uh, maybe very excited. An important point to make: there's obviously a, a lot of um, national pride for Japan with this mission. Um, you've made huge successes already with Hayabu the first Hayabusa mission, and this one, you know, just in terms of what you've achieved, is huge. But um, this is also international because space is, as much as it's about national pride, it's also beyond countries because when we go into space, to borrow your words, Dante, we're all in this together. And do you really feel um, this is an international mission and it's about collaboration and working together? Yes. Uh, actually, uh, uh, we had a very nice collaboration with uh, NASA and the uh, Osiris Lex team. And, uh, uh, at first, after we uh, get the sample, uh, we will give 10% of the sample to, to NASA. Wow. So uh, we have, uh, I think we have very nice collaboration uh, with uh, the people in the US. Patrick, just to bring you in uh, quickly, and I'm wary of time, um, but uh, asteroid, um, Missions with astro astronauts, I'll start again. Missions with astronauts get talked about a lot, but sometimes robotic missions to the, the general public aren't as exciting, even though the, the robots, um, the engineers, you know, the scientists, they're pushing further than humans ever could do. Um, what more do you think we can do, Patrick, to actually um, inspire people about the significance of these missions? Yeah, well, I, I think, I mean, this kind of uh, uh, panel that we do can help. And of course, uh, you know, advertising all the fantastic images that this mission gets is very good and also give the sense of the complexity to the people. I mean, this is really fascinating. Uh, as you said, now we are in an era of cooperation. We have to remember during the Cold War, we are in an era of competition. And now we are cooperating. And the fact that you have Japanese people working with American people, with French people, German people, etc. Demonstrate that when you are the service of knowledge, there is no frontier. We erase the frontier. And this is necessary because these missions are so complex that now not one country can do them. Because we want to explore further. We want to uh, really to achieve the level of understanding that we need. We need this kind of complexity. And I think that for the young generation, it's a way to inspire them because that can give them the, the taste for knowledge, for the curiosity, and the taste for challenges. Because since you don't have a human, what you send, you know, if my iPhone, the battery goes out, I just plug it in in my wall, right? So if you have a problem on a robotic mission, there is nobody to repair. So you need to be very, uh, you know, imaginative and you have a high level of ingenuity in order to make sure that what you send has enough robustness that you can uh, rely on what you send. Moreover, and I could see that with Hayabusa, sometimes you have to be prepared to the unexpected, to be very flexible, and to be able to find solutions almost in real time when a problem happens. So I think that in terms of challenges, uh, it's a really, really fascinating and exciting because uh, you command a spacecraft that is a few hundred million kilometers away. And I was actually in the operation room of Hayabusa 2 for the first touchdown and the, for the small carrier impactor. And there you really see what it is. I mean, this is really crazy. The complexity, the fact that, you know, you send a command and you have to wait several minutes because the, the spacecraft is far away. You have to wait to download the images. So it's super complicated. But then when, it's, when you succeed, it's so much satisfying.
and the pleasure to receive the first images is so great. So I think that it's our job, and I, I do it a lot because of that, to really demonstrate to the people that robotic missions can really help us to uh, achieve the fundamental understanding that we want to get about our origins and the origin of the solar system. That does not, of course, say that we don't need to send humans. I mean, I know that the, for the public is very important. I mean, it makes people dream, but we also have to emphasize the role of these robotic missions. And I think Hayabusa 2 and Osiris Rex are really doing a great job. So we need to, to help pass the message to the public. I think it's, a, I love the point you make um, as well as space exploration is beyond any one country. And I think really when we push out into the frontiers of space, we're no longer citizens of individual countries. We're citizens of planet Earth or, or spaceship Earth, as you can think of it, because of course we're all uh, living in a spaceship. Um, Dante, I just want to ask you um, about OSIRIS-REx, because obviously part of the mission is to do with looking at the potential for mining asteroids. And we know asteroids could be hugely important for the future of space exploration, particularly water, frozen water being used um, as a fuel source to enable people to, or, or missions to go further into the solar system. Can you um, just summarize what OSIRIS-REx will potentially be contributing to the future of space mining? Yeah, part of the objectives of the mission is our resource identification objective, and we really wanted to understand the likelihood that future missions could target this asteroid and extract resources that would be useful for uh, future exploration. And when we've looked at the resources that are the most valuable, a lot of people talk about platinum, for example, um, but that's a hard play because you have to get out to the asteroid, extract the, the mineral, and then bring it back to the surface of the Earth. Uh, what's most valuable is the water. And, and a lot of people are surprised by that because we're so used to water being abundant on the Earth to think that it would be a mineable resource is, is kind of puzzling. But water is great in outer space, first of all, because it's much rarer out there. Space is mostly empty. And you can uh, break it apart and produce liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, which is a very powerful rocket fuel. And when we look at how we launch spacecraft, you know, the second stage of most major launch systems, like the Atlas V rocket that launched OSIRIS-REx, is powered by liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen systems. And that second stage, when it released the spacecraft, it was on an interplanetary trajectory. It had escaped Earth's orbit and it's flying through the solar system. It's a perfectly capable propulsion system. It just ran out of fuel. So if you could rendezvous with that and refuel it for very low cost, all of a sudden you've got an enormous amount of thrust or what we call Delta V in uh, the parlance of solar system exploration. And you can start to think about targeting destinations to, at Mars and beyond for a very low cost because you've got all these assets that you've already launched into space and they just need a, a gas station to refuel at. So essentially what we're doing is no different to what we've done on Earth and we're going to look at living off the land, so to speak, to enable us to explore further. That's right. And, and if you wanted to push human exploration out to the kind of distances that we're talking about, of course you're going to need water for life support systems. It's also a very effective radiation shield, which is the biggest hazard that's facing astronauts in deep space. So you could imagine uh, employing it for human exploration as well. Well, um, I think that's a great final word. And Makoto, Patrick, Dante, um, I just want to thank you as well, because um, thank you for your time, but also thank you for the work that you're doing, because um, I think more than ever, we need hope right now. I think the possibilities to come from space and from science and exploration give us hope. So thank you so much for what you're doing and thank you very much for your time.